The British Army of the late 18th century consisted of over a hundred different infantry regiments, all of which sported the iconic red coat as part of their uniform. However, beyond the red coat, each regiment's uniform sported a slightly different secondary color, a facing color, on their lapels, cuffs, and coat collars, useful for distinguishing between regiments during the chaos of a pitched battle. The 35th Regiment of Foot, for example, had distinctive orange facings, the only regiment in the army to sport such a color. Other regiments, like the 17th, wore white facings, while still others, like the 23rd, wore blue. Nearly every shade of every color was utilized in some form, but with only so many colors on the visible spectrum, repeat colors were inevitable. The most common facing color among all of the British regiments was yellow, with over 20 different regiments in the British Army all sporting yellow facings. It should go without saying, then, that facing color alone was not enough to tell the difference between regiments. To illustrate this point, take a look at this photo from a recent reenactment of the Battle of Bunker Hill. How many regiments are being represented in this block of troops? If you go by facing color alone, you might guess one. But look closer. See the lace patterns on the backs of the coats? Take a look at the lace loops on the coats of the men in the center of the line, and then look to the men on the left, and you'll notice that there are actually two different styles of lace on display here, which leads us finally to the topic of today's video. Regimental Lace. So what is regimental lace, anyway? Well, for starters, it's not the kind of lace you might be thinking of. It's not the stuff you might see on something like an Elizabethan collar, or the stuff that your grandmother's doilies are made out of. Really, for our purposes, regimental lace is just wool tape, the same stuff that's commonly used in this period to bind the edges of hats or other garments. Anytime you see that white edging on the sides of a standard cocked hat, for example, that's wool tape. It's just a thin strand of fabric that can be manipulated into various patterns or loops, and these loops make up the basis for a secondary means of regimental identification, which helps to distinguish regiments that share the same facing color. During the American Revolutionary period, two styles of regimental lace loops were common. On one hand, you have the square loops, where the lace is folded into a simple rectangular pattern. On the other hand, you have bastion loops, so-called because they are pentagonal and the edges jut outward like the bastions of a fort. Bastion loops are further divided into two subcategories, Jews harp and flower pot. Jews harp loops possess a very dramatic concave shape, while flower pot loops are more or less straight, with the curve only becoming more pronounced towards the tip of the loop. Other, less common styles of loops include pointed and scalloped headed. More on those later. Once folded, these loops would be sewn to the cuffs, lapels, and collars of the coat, as well as to the turnbacks and to the rear of the coat, near the small of the back. On the lapels, the loops would usually be sewn on in pairs of ten, around the buttons, and could either be evenly spaced along the length of the facings, or spaced out in sets of two. Crucially, the lace of each regiment also came with a unique pattern of various colored threads, woven along the inner and outer edges. These patterns ranged from relatively simple to incredibly complex. On one hand, regiments like the 10th used a narrow stripe of blue thread along the outer edge. The 13th used a wide yellow stripe through the center of the lace. Other regiments, on the other hand, used very complex patterns, such as the 15th, whose lace features a red stripe along the inner edge and a yellow stripe along the outer edge that is intersected diagonally with black thread. This diagonal pattern is called a worm. We know what many of these lace patterns would have looked like today because they were catalogued in a book titled Facings and Lacings of the Marching Regiments of Foot of the British Army, 1768, which is now in the Royal Collection Trust. Illustrations of the various facing and lace combinations can also be found in The Uniforms of Several Regiment of Foot in His Majesty's Service, 1771. Although the renderings are simplistic, they are effective at demonstrating the subtle uniform variations that existed across the regimental spectrum. In addition to differentiating between regiments, lace could also be used to differentiate between ranks. Those fancy lace patterns which we just discussed were only worn by private soldiers, musicians, and by lower-ranking non-commissioned officers, namely corporals, who wore the same uniform as the privates, 
distinguished only by a single white epaulet worn on the right shoulder. Regimental sergeants would follow the looping pattern of the rest of their regiment, but their lace would be plain, without a pattern, one of the many ways in which sergeants were distinguished from the rank and file. Officers' lace would, again, generally, but not always, follow the looping pattern of the other ranks, but their lace would be metallic and would be either silver or gold in color, depending on the regiment. Guards' regiments also had plain lace, making the different looping patterns and spacings all the more important to distinguish between them. The first foot guards, for example, wore ten bastion loops set evenly across the facings of their coats. The Coldstream guards wore ten scallop-headed loops set in pairs of two, while the third guards wore pointed loops done in sets of three. With all of this in mind, it's safe to say that the system of identifying regiments via lace pattern is, in a word, complicated. It's not hard to see why the system would eventually fall out of favor by the mid-19th century, only to be superseded by the shoulder titles and cloth insignias of the 20th century. Fortunately, though, the Royal Clothing Warrant of 1768 also states for each regimental coat to include the number of the regiment on the buttons of the coat. So, if you need to identify a regiment in a pinch, and don't happen to have the complete compendium of regimental lace patterns on hand, you can always just use those. Hey everyone, hope you all enjoyed that quick little video. I'm just dropping in again at the end to announce that I am now on Patreon, and actually have been for some time, and even made a community post about it a while back, but I was waiting for the right moment to properly announce it in a video. So here it is. Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for a while now, especially with how spotty the YouTube algorithm has been in regards to promoting content, especially history-related content. But I was hesitant to pull the trigger on it because, as you may have noticed, I have not been able to upload quite as much as I might have liked to lately. So it just didn't feel right to charge a monthly fee with no promise of monthly content. However, I have found a workaround to that in that I currently have it set up to charge per creation. Meaning, if you subscribe to it, you'll only be charged when and if I make a new video. There's no tiers as of yet, which is not to say that I won't add some once I've become more familiar with the platform. I just haven't been able to think of any perks that sound fair yet. So, as it stands right now, the Patreon is simply to provide a means for people to show some extra support to the channel if they feel so inclined. I want to stress that there is absolutely no obligation to subscribe, but if you enjoy the content that I produce and you would like to support me in that way, the option is now available to you. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't done so already, and as always, God save the king.